everything to screw Dylan. Let me give you a brief background as to who I am. So my girlfriend is in Dylan's inner circle. And by inner circle, I mean inner, inner circle. Like they've hung out almost every day since the incident occurred. And I've seen her a plethora of times as well. So you're going to notice I'm not going to use words like allegedly, supposedly, because all of this is actual firsthand factual information. Um, where should I start uh, to clear things up? Um, first of all, there's a lot of misconception about uh, Dylan suffering from PTSD or trauma or any of that. None of that is accurate. Um, in fact, when we try to console Dylan after the incident, she's the one that was laughing at me and my girlfriend and I talking about we're so weird and we tried to give her a hug and stuff. Um, so she's still the same old Dylan. She's had a rough life growing up. She's been through a lot. Uh, she doesn't have PTSD and didn't suffer any trauma. Um, the incident that night, uh, and what I'm referring to with the feds, the feds actually put a lot of words into her mouth that she didn't say herself first. So they, there was a lot of leading statements that they were insinuating to her. And she was really scared the first few days, obviously, after the incident occurred. So, like, the reason none of it makes sense in the affidavit is because it didn't really happen that way. So she never stood there shocked when she saw the individual. She was just standing in her doorway, like, you know, like anybody who opens the door. It was just, you know, she opened the door and yelled at Ethan and Zana and who, who they thought, who she thought was their friend. She yelled at them to be quiet. That's what was going on with that situation. And, and she just went back into the room. She locked the door like usual and, you know, went to sleep. Everything was quiet after she yelled at them. So she didn't think anything of it. For everyone who's creating these random stories about her being shot. So according to him and according to this story, he yelled, at, uh, Dylan yelled at them and then turned around and closed the door and locked it and went to sleep, didn't think anything of it. According to that part, it doesn't specify whether or not he came in contact visually, you know, person to person there. Uh, maybe he's mistaken because he talks about, you know, the FBI coming with pictures and things of that nature. But I did want to bring that out right away. Is he says she yelled at him, turned around, locked the door. Now again, I, I want to reference this. I I don't know who this person is. It is um, I'll, uh, as far as the voice goes. Um, I don't know how verified or how close he is to you know how if it's real or not. However, some of the things that he was saying a few weeks ago, almost a month ago, are, are coming out as far as at least from what News Nation is reporting. And so I just wanted to reference that one more time. Doctor, traumatized. She didn't realize anything was going on. And it might sound crazy, it might sound dumb, but she really had no clue anything was going on. Uh, they're being a little loud, so she yelled at them to be quiet. And that's it, she, closed. she locked her door and she just went back to her room. You know, and she didn't want to be nosy or anything. So, you know, she, she was kind of new to that house, so she didn't want to be nosy and, you know, get up all up in their business, especially, at, you know, in the middle of the night or early morning. So it's as simple as that. Everyone trying to blow that whole situation into something that's not. Um, so, yeah, that's that. And she didn't actually get a real good look at uh, at Brian. You know, at the time, she assumed it was one of Zana and Ethan's friend who was just getting ready to leave. Who was walking out she didn't get that good of a look the feds were really aggressive with dylan the first few days which is why she hired the attorney to begin with because of the treatment of her during the interview more like an interrogation to be honest um so that's why she got an attorney because the way they were talking to her and you know they didn't really understand or believe why she's the only one alive when you kind of skip rooms to get to the other two rooms um, so she didn't really like the feel of how the, you know, the interrogators or the feds were, were talking to her. Um, and within like a few days 
after the incident, they approached her with pictures of Brian. I was like, is this the guy? Do you think this is the guy? This is definitely him, right? And So according to him, after a few days, now, is that a few days after the interrogation portion of what he was talking about, you know, at first few days where, um, you know, just strictly, you know, hounding her and talking to her about, um, you know, the, you know, why did they skip her room? You know, why was she alive? She yelled out. I mean, clearly, if she yelled out and in the manner that she did, you know, the whole thing about, you know, did Brian Koberger maybe perhaps not see her doesn't play into this. Now, perhaps, perhaps, maybe he's thinking, you know, he's doing he's in the commission of this crime. He hears somebody yell out. He's thinking that maybe perhaps they're calling the police. And so he needs to get out of there ASAP, sees her, knows that she had yelled probably just leaves right just because police are on the way this is rural idaho this isn't a big area this is a small area so you're probably figuring out that the police are going to get there within a matter of minutes uh, if not less than that you know the police department wasn't very far from uh the uh, the house it was just a few blocks away probably about maybe eight to ten blocks and so <clears throat> In my opinion, I mean, it, well, we'll put it this way in the in the probable cause affidavit uh, at 326 a.m. He's seen at the uh, 700 block of Indian Hills Drive. That's beyond the police department. Right. That's behind it. That's also in a neighborhood city in a neighborhood where he had to go through some, you know, stop signs and things of that nature. It was a little bit further distance and it took him all but three minutes to get from that area to the 1122 King Road residence, a police officer not having to follow, you know, with lights and sirens, not having to maybe completely follow the rules of the road and lights and stop signs, things of that nature probably could get there in about two and a half to two minutes. And so and that's not including if anybody or there isn't an officer that's nearby on patrol. And so once he heard somebody scream, it may have been all right. It's up. Time's up. And that may have been also why. Uh, he may have left the uh, knife sheath. You know, he uh, hears somebody, forgets, you know, he's like, oh, crap, there's somebody awake. Somebody heard me. Somebody's calling the police. Time to get out of here. Forgets the knife sheath uh, altogether. All and so doesn't realize it until after he's left. Uh, we'll continue. I'll back it up a little bit. Brian, I was like, is this the guy? Do you think this is the guy? This is definitely him, right? And they were almost leading her to believe this has to be the person. Sorry about that. So well, either way, we'll go back a little bit. He's saying that Dylan, um, they gave her pictures of him and pressed uh, pressed her uh, for the identification of Brian Kohlberger. Now, he stated a few days. The From all indications, the information wasn't given over to WSU to locate Brian Kohlberger's car until late November. You know, that's more than a few days, e even if, you know, let's just say um, we'll give the benefit of the doubt that they pressed her for about five days and then gave her an additional week, seven days. That's still not enough time for the time that WSU went out there and located Brian Koberger's vehicle and sent over his picture to uh, Officer Payne, who then saw the eyebrows and thought that these two people could be the same person. And so this is well before that. I wonder what else they had that pointed the arrow at Brian Koberger, if this is all true, of course. We'll continue to listen. Brian, I was like, is this the guy? Do you think this is the guy? This is definitely him, right? And they were almost leading her to believe this has to be the person. And she wasn't really sure. But they kind of put those words in her mouth. It's almost like, you know, they were insinuating it so much to where she was like, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, no, it's definitely him. Um, and that's when they just kind of like ran with it. So what you see in the affidavit is it, it just, it didn't play out that way. Um, so um, Dylan's attorney and her, and actually all of us are pretty upset at how they threw her under the bus. 
Yeah, I hear that shuffling too. This is fast forwarded. So um, initially I thought it sounded like paper shuffling, you know, at normal speeds. And so I think this guy's reading from what he wrote. We'll continue. And actually all of us are pretty upset at how they threw her under the bus in the affidavit. When's the last time you've seen a witness or like a snitch in a case, their actual names being mentioned? You know, the fact that they didn't redact it. Um, we all. He used the term snitch in the case. Informant comes up quite a bit. Now, they put Dylan Mortensen's name in the probable cause affidavit. I don't think that they're trying to. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't think that they're trying to hide her, conceal her, and not put her into the case or when trial comes. So I don't think that's the case. But they use the term snitch. I mean, and, you know, maybe perhaps Dylan didn't tell her friends everything, especially if she may have known the, the person or the perpetrator. Perhaps she, she told the police who she thought they were or who he was and uh, didn't want to seem to be a snitch. And so told her friends that they showed me pictures of somebody. But the term snitch comes out just kind of seems like maybe, well, this also could be a reason why, you know, if, if these folks here are, are thinking in this terminology and thinking in this world or what, that they're snitches instead of coming forward to the police with the information that you have, that might lead to why also they were calling friends instead of the police during the time of, of worry and the most time of panic and, and uncertainty. And that's one thing I want to bring up, too. So this source goes throughout all this information, but doesn't bring out that Dylan called everybody in the house. That was revealed by one of the family members of Ethan Chapin and why they were questioning why Dylan didn't call police. She was able she was whatever she saw scared her enough to at least call the other, the, you know, the other housemates. Now, perhaps, and I've said this before, maybe Dylan did answer. I mean, uh, Bethany did answer. And during that call, uh, it gave her some sort of false sense of security, so to speak. And so she went to sleep. That's not how this plays out, but it does seem logical um, and possible. This guy here who's talking, let's just say he's 100% accurate. His girlfriend is very close to Dylan. It, it, it the, it doesn't mean that he got all the information right or he's not exaggerating the story either. So it's not coming firsthand. We'll continue. I'll think that the feds and prosecutors threw her name in there purposely to apply more pressure because Dylan was really wishy-washy during the interrogation. And with them, you know, putting these words, you know, set in stone on paper, it kind of puts a lot of pressure on her now because everyone views her as like some star witness, the star of the case. So that's what we all believe that she kind of is getting screwed over by, you know, the feds and the prosecutor, you know, because now she has to testify and she has to say kind of what, you know, what words they put in her mouth instead of what she actually believed, you know, and what she actually knows happened, you know, like with her own words, not words that were like shoved in her mouth, you know. This seems to allude that she knows something different and that her belief is different than what's in the probable cause affidavit. Um, I question, what is it that he thinks could be different? Is it just the fact that perhaps, you know, the only thing that's different is that she didn't see anything really and she didn't really identify Brian Koberger and that the, uh, you know, that the law enforcement are are trying to push her hand into, you know, positively identifying Brian. That reeks a cover up, <laughs> to be honest with you. But you know, I would, I would, I would expect the police department to come forward once they had pictures of Brian Koberger and to ask her to identify and to see if she could identify him. But to apply the pressure that he's alluding is, is kind of. Uh, it's putting somebody under duress and that's not really the typically the best, you know, approach. Cause if it goes, if it comes out, 
that she was under duress and forced to make these, you know, this witness testimony, then a lot of this case is going to get thrown out. We'll continue. So, yeah, her attorney is pretty upset. She's pretty upset. But at the same time, she knows that, you know, she can be a huge help in this case. So it's not like she's identifying somebody she didn't see. It just didn't play out necessarily like, oh, bushy eyebrows. She saw bushy eyebrows, you know, and was able to 100% identify him, you know. Um, it's just initially when, you know, detectives and feds came in and took over the scene, the scene had been contaminated so badly by, A, the local authorities when they first came, first responders, they stomped all over the place, contaminated the scene. You know? He's not wrong. This is a picture from that day there, and you can see that this officer here is not wearing booties. Um you know, it looks like there appears his hands are covered. He probably is wearing gloves, but he's not wearing booties over his boots. He's stomping all over the ground inside this house. He's not wrong there. Just wanted to point that out. You know, all the, you know, other people that were at the house, they were, you know, walking up and down the steps, you know, to make sure what they're seeing is what they're really seeing. Um, so, I mean, this is a scene that was really badly contaminated. So to equal the playing field, the feds feel like, you know, having a star witness is, you know, is, is critical here. Um, but just the way. I will note that, uh, that part has to be speculation on his part. Um, regardless of what Dylan knows or what Dylan has told him, uh, there's no way that he knows that information that. The feds need a star witness. They need a witness to cover up some kind of deficiency in the evidence. I don't know if he knows what the entire evidence is. I know we all don't. And so I just wanted to bring that up. The way she was being interrogated initially was, uh, it's kind of crazy. It's not what you guys think. They weren't being all sensitive and gentle to her. They were really accusatory and kind of, you know, pressured, you know, put, put the press on her. Thought that she might have something to do with it because it just didn't make sense to them why she's the only one alive and on top of that didn't see anything or really hear anything you know she didn't want to be nosy didn't want to you know get up in a roommate's business she told him to be quiet you know i mean the last thing that crossed her mind was people are getting slaughtered next door and upstairs you know so um i think uh, that's pretty much everything i've covered so yeah just to go over the whole you know suffering trauma she was shocked as she saw him walk past her like it's not as dramatic as you guys think it, like he was already halfway towards the kitchen and walking out. Um, and for all of y'all that are scratching your heads, yes, police do lie. They've kind of thrown everybody around the ringer through this whole case from the very start. Um, and you have to think about it. Why would a, a survivor, a victim, have to hire an attorney? Obviously, they were mistreating her pretty badly as they're interrogating her, you know, now, especially now throwing her name in the affidavit like that. You know, that's all because they're pretty upset she hired an attorney to begin with yeah, and because they want to put a lot of pressure on her from the public for her to be the star witness. Um, but aside from that, she's doing good. She's the same old Dylan. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, no, there's no trauma, PTSD, anything. You know, she really feels for, you know, her friends who are deceased. And, you know, she does beat herself up a little bit about, you know, not being more involved in the situation that night. But, you know, realistically, I mean, something like that's not going to cross your mind. That's something like that's taking place in your house. You know, so, yes, yeah, she does feel for the family. And, you know, she's really saddened by the whole situation. But as far as her as an individual, she's still the, the same person. She's not like a traumatized uh, individual, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think I pretty much covered everything. And um, uh, let's see. Yeah, no, that's everything. And that was everything that he had. Um, so a lot of a lot of stuff to unpack there, a lot of stuff to listen to. It's a, um, you know, if it's true type of situation, then, um, well, you know, I think this brings up a little bit more questions and maybe perhaps even more of a, a defense for Brian Koberger, who, you know, let's face it, that witness testimony probably wasn't the strongest evidence there. You have somebody possibly under the influence of alcohol in the middle of the night identifying somebody who's covered their mouth and nose. And the only identifiers are his eyebrows, his height and weight. That's not the biggest or the strongest case there is. Now, when you compile that up with, 
you know, his phone being off at the time of the uh, of the incident. You compile that up with um, him being around the area 12 times, the DNA on the sheath, you know, everything else altogether you know, in a bundle kind of points in this direction of Brian Koberger. But there are certainly, certainly some things that uh, open up the eye a little bit and maybe draw a, a question of, hmm, like, what's this? type of situation and so let me know in the comment section guys do you guys find the uh person speaking credible do you think that his story is true it does seem to kind of align with what was reported to uh news nation um and what news nation would put out there last night like again that's the only reason why i put this out there was because of the fact that new nation news nation states that they've got a source so i'm assuming they vetted that source and found that that person was at least who he says or whoever it was that came forward. It may not even have been this man. It may have been his girlfriend that came forward um, and spoke to News Nation. However, this information that came forward was a little too close to what I had heard before and thought I would throw this out there. Let me know in the comment section. Please hit, please hit that like and subscribe button. Ring that notification bell. Don't forget tonight we're going to go live again. Don't want to miss it.